So once again, Alhamdulillah, thank you very much for all of you joining today. Uh, and then uh, today's webinar is uh, once again with our Sheikh Mufti Ismail Desai. Those who doesn't know Mufti Ismail, let me just briefly tell you Mufti Ismail Desai is Sharia advisor with Paif. He is an internationally reputed Sharia advisor and investment banker who currently serves as special advisor as special advisor at various Islamic finance institutions, Islamic banks, investment entities, and educational institutes around the world. Mufti Ismail has developed various Sharia auditing governance and risk management standards for Islamic finance institutions and has issued several thousands expert legal opinions, fatwas with a special focus on Islamic finance and economics. Mufti Ismail has attended and delivered papers at international conferences and has created the first ever Sharia compliant model for leverage structure financing and finance and currency trading. So I don't want to be further intervening and uh, letting Mufti Ismail and you take on uh, the session. Let me take a leave and uh, Mufti Ismail, you may start the session. Jazakallah khair. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasoolihi al-kareem amma ba'd. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the management of Taif Digital Institute of Islamic Finance for arranging this exclusive webinar presentation on blockchain and cryptocurrency and the Sharia compliance thereof. I would also like to thank one and all for attending this webinar presentation on cryptocurrency and blockchain. It is indeed heartwarming to find various participants showing passion and interest to learn about the Sharia compliance of such new innovations in the global marketplace. I would like to begin this session by providing you with a quick background to today's session in terms of the construct of today's session. So we would have two parts. The first part is in terms of the technical aspect and a presentation on cryptocurrency and blockchain and the Sharia compliance implications thereof. Secondly is we would have a question and answer session to answer your questions. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to write your questions in the Q&A session. Uh, if we do not answer any of your questions during the session, then we will attempt to answer them via email. So without further ado, I would like to begin today's presentation, which will essentially cover three aspects. The first is in terms of our broad credentials as Global Islamic Financial Services and Taif Digital Institute of Islamic Finance. Secondly, is we will go into an introduction to blockchain and cryptocurrency. We will also then discuss the Sharia implications of cryptocurrency and blockchain. And lastly, we will discuss the future trends of cryptocurrency and blockchain and how that can benefit the Islamic financial services sector. In terms of our credentials, Global Islamic Financial Services has been involved as a special Sharia advisor to various institutions across the globe including the Ethica Institute of Islamic Finance, Botswana Life Insurance Limited, which is the largest insurer in Botswana, Hijaz Financial Services based in Australia, which is the largest Islamic financial services provider in Australia, HPZ Bank based in South Africa, the Sharia Review Bureau based in Bahrain, uh, and we advise various governments and central banks on Islamic finance. We've also set up the Russian Islamic Finance Council, which is based in Moscow, and ha currently has over 124,000 members across uh, Russia and, this, and the former CIS countries. In terms of some of the products and services that we've developed, uh, GIFS have developed various groundbreaking and innovative solutions, including Sharia compliant sukuk for the South African market. We've issued hundreds and thousands of fatawa or Islamic legal edicts around Islamic finance and economics. And we've developed various Sharia compliant wealth management products 
for various institutions. We've also advised a South American government on Sukuk, and we've conducted various Sharia audits for various institutions globally. Uh, as part of the service of GIFS is that we've structured over $8.7 billion worth of investment banking deals in terms of Sukuk, mergers and acquisitions, et cetera. And we currently manage over $4.7 billion of private equity funds in the form of various investments and syndications globally. In terms of our Sharia auditing and advisory services, we provide the full spectrum of services, including Sharia product development, fatawa and certification, development of the Sharia board, uh, Sukuk and Islamic fund structuring, etc. And our motto is embracing Islamic finance through Sharia compliance, achieving new heights in expansion and growth. We believe that through Islamic finance and Sharia compliance, that we're able to achieve true growth from an economic uh, perspective. We are able to also alleviate poverty to a large extent by adopting Islamic finance. We now move over into the technical aspects of today's discussion, which is blockchain and cryptocurrency. We would first dissect what exactly is blockchain and cryptocurrency by providing you with a brief, brief background to blockchain and, and cryptocurrency. So what exactly is, is cryptocurrency? So a cryptocurrency is a medium of exchange that is digital, encrypted, and decentralized. So I want to go through the definition uh, clearer. So a cryptocurrency is a medium of exchange. In other words, it's not um, an asset of value. It is a medium of exchange. It is digital, similar to e-money or uh, uh, digital money. It is encrypted. So in other words, it is secured and it is decentralized, which means that it is not controlled by one single entity or party. So if we look at the diagram, um, and I would try to enlarge in the diagram, uh, and we can go through how blockchain works. So let's say, for example, someone requests a transaction. Um, the requested transaction is, is broadcasted to a P2P or peer-to-peer -peer network. Now, this peer-to-peer -peer network is essentially a network of nodes, which are different, you know, computers uh, in the form of nodes uh, that would then verify the transaction. Once a transaction has been verified, then a new block is created in the public ledger. And, and we'll come to the different types of le ledgers further on in, in the presentation. But the ledger is basically uh, a digital ledger that will record the transaction in the form of a block. Um, and this block then gets added to the existing blockchain where it is permanent and cannot be changed. The transaction has now been completed. So cryptocurrency is simply a medium of exchange. It is created and stored electronically in the blockchain using monetary units and to verify the transfer of funds. And for, for example, we all know the famous example of Bitcoin or BTC. So let's look at some of the qualities of cryptocurrency. It, ha it has no intrinsic value. It's, it's not rede redeemable for another commodity. It has no physical form, so it is digital currency. Its supply is not determined by a central bank. So it is totally decentralized. But we will dissect some of the features as we go along. Um, and as you can see, here's another slide of how uh, the blockchain works um, via different nodes that verify a transaction. So there are essentially four types of cryptocurrencies. So blockchain is the underlying technology that backs a crypto. Uh, and then cryptos itself, there are four types of cryptos. So you have uh, a store of value, uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. You have digital currencies uh, like Libra, for example, which is backed by Facebook. You have security tokens, and then you have utility tokens like Ethereum. Now, these different cryptos are either backed by what is called a public ledger, which is essentially a totally decentralized uh, form of uh, crypto, uh, which is not controlled by, by, by private entities. Then you have a private um, you know, ledger, which is controlled by a group of entities uh, that can control uh, the authorization process of a blockchain. And then you have the hybrid model, 
which is a mixture between public and private. Uh, so for example, uh, you have uh, certain cryptos that are, that are based on the hybrid model and you have various global institutions like JP Morgan, et cetera, that, you, that have certain uh, hybrid ledgers that are controlled um, by, by the institution. So with that, let's go into a background to money and the Sharia view of money and cryptocurrency. So when we look at money, uh, coins were used in 600 BC. Uh, perhaps the first example was by King Aliatis of Lydia in present day Turkey. Uh, and in, 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 in 9000 BC, you had barter trade where people would, um, would exchange goods for goods, uh, commodities, etc. So the, there was no usage of, um, you know, money per se. And perhaps one of the earliest examples of bank notes, uh, as we, we see today, is uh, China, the Chinese state. Uh, issued banknotes in 118 BC. Uh, thereafter, you had, um, you know, what is termed as um, fiat currency that was backed by gold. And perhaps in the early 1950s, you had the likes of Western Union that essentially created electronic money uh, to transfer funds from the different branches globally. Um, and then you had the Bretton Woods Agreement in the early 1940s, where a fiat currency was no more backed by what is called the gold standard, where you would get, um, you know, the equivalent value of gold in your fiat currency. So fiat currency was initially backed by gold. And with the Bretton Woods Agreement, the agreement uh, with global financial leaders was for the fiat currency not to be backed anymore by gold. Uh, and that was in the early 19, 1940s. Um, so when we talk of um, cryptocurrency, there are three main views of uh, Sharia scholars when it comes to cryptocurrency. The first view um, is that it is impermissible and the likes of which uh, have uh, promoted this view include uh, Sheikh Haytham, uh, Haddad from the UK and other scholars uh, from Pakistan like Mufti Daqi Usmani, uh, Mufti Daqi Usmani, Hafidahullah and other scholars uh, in Saudi Arabia, etc. And their view is that because of the volatility and the fact that the crypto is not backed by any government and it is not sanctioned by, by any credible institution uh, and given the fact that there is high volatility, that the crypto uh, currency is impermissible. The second view is that cryptocurrency is not a currency per se, but it is simply an asset of value. And their view is that it can be construed to be mal or an asset of value, but it cannot be currency because of the volatility and it does not have the functions of, of currency per se. And the last view, is the view that cryptocurrency can be considered to be an actual form of money or currency per se. And their view is that uh, the crypto uh, has the qualities of being a currency and it also has value. And this um, is the view of various ulama and scholars. So when it comes to currency in Islam, what is used to determine what is currency and what is not currency. So this is the key question in terms of how we determine whether something is considered to be a form of thaman or currency or simply an asset of value or whether an asset of value in itself um, is Sharia compliant or not. So perhaps there are three main considerations when we look at whether we consider something to be a currency or not. The first is what is called Thamaniya, which is, can we consider crypto to be a valid medium of exchange or not? And when we look at um, cryptos like Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, etc., we find that various institutions, the, like of, the likes of PayPal, Coindesk, and other institutions allow for crypto to be used as a valid medium of exchange 
to pay for services, etc. Um, and we all know the, the famous fiasco of Tesla that initially allowed uh, Bitcoin to be used to purchase Tesla. But as we go further um, and crypto and the science and sector of crypto is advanced, then you would find uh, the greater acceptability of crypto as we go along. The second important point is what is termed as, as istilah, uh, which is essentially market acceptance uh, through what is called urf and ada, where according to the masses, it, it has wide acceptance as a form of currency and a medium of exchange. Now, perhaps one, ex one example of this is what is called um, fulus. So fulus, uh, during, the, during the time um, of um, various uh, scholars that in the marketplaces of Baghdad, there was a form of bronze metal that was used in the marketplace to, to trade. This was not considered to be um, official currency, but it was used as a form of medium of exchange to, to trade goods. So although it, it did not have official currency status um, as a valid form of currency, it was used as a medium of exchange and that was, that was accepted. And you find that uh, the scholars of fiqh and Islamic jurisprudence use the term fulus very often in various constructs uh, of Islamic jurisprudence. So hence, the crypto, uh, in terms of certain cryptos like Bitcoin, etc., can be construed to be a valid medium of exchange because of the wide acceptance uh, or urf and ada in, uh, by the marketplace in terms of determining the usage of crypto as a valid form of medium of exchange. And lastly, is what is called taqawwum or something that has a value in Sharia. So uh, what determines that is that there are certain things that are considered to be, um, that are considered to be uh, mubah al uh, uh, hal or are considered to have um, or are considered uh, to have uh, general uh, ibaha. In other words, that you have, for example, oxygen or you have air. Now, can you, can, can you sell all the air in the world? You can't because it is considered to be, to, to be permissible for anyone to, to use uh, air and oxygen. But yes, if you take the air and you store it, then you can sell it. So uh, anything that is considered to have value in Sharia, uh, then that can also be considered to be a valid form of currency. So for example, one cannot use pork, for example, as a medium of currency, because from a Sharia perspective, it, does, it is not considered to have value or qima. Uh, so these are the three main criteria for classifying uh, something to be a medium of exchange in Sharia. Now, when we look at the different types of Athman or mediums of exchange from a Sharia classification or Takifi perspective, in terms of what is considered from a jurisprudential perspective to be considered as a valid medium of exchange. So essentially, you have two types of thaman. You have uh, al athman al khilqiyah and you have al athman al urfiya So thaman al khilqi refers to fiat currency or what is termed as a currency um, by human intervention. And the second type of currency um, uh, is, is termed as uh, 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 Thamani uh, Urfi, which is has a uh, uh, wide market acceptance. So Thamani Khilqi is, for example, gold and silver. And there is a hadith which states that gold and silver will be the actual currencies uh, according to Sharia until the day of Qiyamah. So uh, gold and silver, that is prescribed in the Sunnah. And we know in the hadith that it appears that gold and silver, there are special rules from a 
uh, from an exchange, from a monetary exchange perspective, in terms of how gold and silver is exchanged. And then you have, uh, from an Urfi perspective, in terms of those uh, uh, you know, currencies that are, that are accepted by, by, market, by the market norm, we have fiat money, which is you know, legal tender, as we have today, US dollars, British pounds, etc. You have e-money, where you have you know, um, you know, money in, in the digital system um, that is moved like uh, interbank money, uh, etc. Then you have fiduciary money, like for example, treasury bills, T bills, uh, etc. And then you have uh, uh, you have commodity uh, commodity money. So uh, these are the different forms of of currency as we currently have it. So obviously, if we look at e money, we look at fiduciary money, etc. It is not hard to believe that cryptocurrency could also be a valid form of money if we look at the various definitions of money. So money is not does not necessarily have does does not necessarily need to have legal tender in order for it to have value. So as long as from a shari perspective, a medium of exchange needs to have widespread expectance or rorf and hada. Now, when we look at uh, the different views of the scholars of the different uh, madahib or schools of thought from an Islamic jurisprudential perspective, we find that Imam Muhammad rahimahullah, who was one of the famous students of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, has accepted, and his view is the preferred view or the um, the, the Rajah view in the Hanafi madhab that as long as there is istilah or, the, or there is widespread usage and ta'amul, there is widespread uh, uh, usage and acceptance uh, of a medium of exchange uh, or a commodity, then it, it can be considered to be um, a, a valid medium of exchange. Uh, you find that Imam Shafi rahimahullah has mentioned that uh, a valid medium of exchange is something that has desirability. And similar views are shared with the, with the Hanbali madhab and the Maliki Madhab. So therefore, um, we will analyze certain cryptos like Bitcoin, etc., in terms of whether they fall under these definitions of being a valid medium of exchange or not. However, what is undisputed is that these cryptos in general, be, they can be considered to be mal or something that has value from a Shari perspective, as long as the underlying activities of these cryptos do not have impermissible elements, and we and we will come to that as as we go along in this in this presentation. So, in other words, that we have now dissected what is the Shari basis of something having uh, uh, of something becoming a medium of exchange or not. So let's look at the the properties of of a cryptocurrency, uh, and then we will analyze that further. Some of the properties of a cryptocurrency include that it is irreversible. So once a transaction is done, then the transaction is concluded. Uh, however, you have examples of what is called hard forking, um, uh, etc. It is pseudonymous. Um, it is fast and secure. It is permissionless. Uh, and then you have different ledgers, as I mentioned. You have a public ledger, a private ledger, and a hybrid ledger. So what are some of the cryptocurrencies out there? So you have Bitcoin, uh, which was uh, apparently set up by one Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, you have Ethereum or ETH, Ripple, Litecoin, Cardano, XRP, Dogecoin, etc. So these are the different cryptocurrencies. And obviously, they are backed by different forms of uh, the blockchain. And they have different activities through what is called decentralized finance or DeFi. So some of the benefits of crypto is that it prevents fraud. Uh, identity theft, uh, there is immediate settlement as opposed to you know, the, the current world banking system where through the Bank of Interna International Settlements, you have uh, T, T plus one, T plus two in terms of settlement where sometimes a transaction could take a few days, etc. Uh, so for example, if a person makes a US dollar transaction, the US dollar has to go through uh, the um, Bank of New York Mellon in New York and once they have approved the transaction uh, through the uh, Federal Reserve Banking System of the United States of America, then U.S. dollars are released globally. But with the with the with crypto 
there is no uh, there is no issues with settlement and there is immediate settlement. Uh, obviously, then there is the issue of fees. There is no cash management uh, fees, etc. And uh, perhaps one of the most important things here is ownership. Is that you actually own uh, the crypto in the entire in the entire chain. So you control uh, the visibility uh, of of the crypto. So uh, let's look at the market cap of cryptocurrency. So as you can see, uh, perhaps Bitcoin ranks the highest uh, with um, with over over a trillion uh, dollars in, in market capitalization. However, it does fluctuate from time to time, as 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 we've noticed. You have other coins like Ethereum, Binance, uh, Cardano, uh, XRP, um, Stella, Dogecoin, etc. So, what is the total market cap um, of 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 crypto? As you can see, the um, gradual uh, increase of the market capitalization of crypto over a period of time, as per CoinDesk, um, with over one trillion dollar market capitalization, and this is expected to grow up to $5 trillion in the next five to seven years. Uh, now let's look at the technical definition of money. Uh, what do economists have to say about money? What, what in the view is considered to be money from a technical perspective? Um, so the main features of money include the fact that it's a store of value, it is a unit of account, it is a medium of exchange, and it is a standard of deferred payment. So when one wants to, uh, you know, make a deferred payment, then one uses, um, you know, uh, money to defer payment. So this is from an economist uh, perspective and not from a Sharia perspective. Um, and some of the, the main features of, of money is acceptability. The fact that it, that, it, that it has widespread acceptance, it can be enforceable. So if one owes uh, one, let's say $100 or $200, then one can enforce the transaction. Thirdly, is that it is fungible. So fungible means that it is it is it is misly. It is not pimi. So in other words, that from a Sharia perspective, uh, it can be replicated. So as you have one dollar, you can have another one dollar. It is divisible. So if I owe you a hundred dollars, um, I can pay you in 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 increments of ten dollars, twenty dollars, for example. It is something which is scarce. So there is no. Um, you know, there is no uh, inf infinite amount of, of money. It is something which is portable and it is stable. Now, if you look at cryptos like Bitcoin, definitely, you know, Bitcoin would have all of these elements uh, in, in every form. Now, from a Shadi perspective, again, uh, uh, some of the senior uh, jurists and fuqaha, like Ibn Nujayim, rahimahullah, and Allama Ibn Abidin, rahimahumullah, uh, very senior scholars in the Hanafi Madhab uh, have mentioned now that their view is that uh, money has to have desirability and storability. So uh, money has to be an asset that is des that is desirable and it has to have storability that can be used in the form of, in, in the time of need and necessity. And if you look at cryptos like Bitcoin, etc., definitely there is desirability, otherwise people would not be trading them. And secondly, is there is storability because in the time of need and necessity, these cryptos can be cashed out through exchanges and wallets, etc., and one can earn what one can cash out their, their bitcoins. The other important point from a Sharia perspective it is to look at the maqasid of Sharia. So you know when we when we look at um, you know the permissibility and impermissibility and the Sharia view uh, of cryptos, we also need to look at the broader uh, maqasid and masalih of Sharia in terms of the broader context of why something should be permissible and why something should be impermissible. So, you know, there are various, uh, you know, uh, usul of Sharia that need to be applied when we, when, when we look at whether something should be permitted or not. And I will mention a few usul regarding this and provide you with examples. So the first is that anything that leads uh, to a dispute that is also permiss impermissible, Secondly, is that if there is a jahala e fahisha, if there is a great amount of ambiguity in a transaction, then that is also impermissible. Thirdly, is that if you, if there is a transaction that leads to something that is impermissible, or it could lead to an impermissible transaction, then that transaction is also impermissible. Uh, and also, uh, when you look at the broader. Um, <clears throat> 
when you look at the broader, um, you know, protection and tahfiz and hifz uh, of the wealth of people, does crypto allow for people's wealth to be protected or does it allow for market abuse at a broader level? So while these may be uh, overarching principles and not necessarily imply whether something should be Sharia compliant or not, from a fiqh perspective, from an Islamic jurisprudential perspective, we need to look at these masalih more carefully to understand whether the permissibility of crypto implicates the stability of the global economic system. Uh, and does it allow uh, for manipulation where the richer countries and the West um, uh, use their dominance in a particular sphere to control the masses in Muslim economies and Muslim countries. And what we've seen uh, over, over the past uh, decades is that uh, Muslim countries were uh, controlled by imperialists and, and colonizers that dominated their economies uh, and created the fiat uh, uh, money system where essentially through the global economic system and fiat currency, um, you know, th their economies were enslaved. Uh, to, to, to other Western economies and the global economic system. So we need to look at the broader, uh, you know, market implications of uh, the permissibility of, uh, of cryptocurrency, et cetera. But when we look at the, the overarching principle from a Shari perspective is that al al fi shay al that uh, uh, anything is impermissible, anything is permissible as long as we can prove that it's impermissible. So this is the overarching principle when it comes to cryptocurrency, etc. Obviously, now would um, uh, would 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 uh, decentralize finance. Uh, that uh, you know there, there is the aspect of staking, where there is uh, fintech transactions that occur on an interest basis. So staking, uh, pancake uh, pancake swap, etc. These are impermissible transactions where interest is earned. So obviously, then those cryptos will not be Sharia compliant. Uh, <clears throat> so we have to look at the underlying activities of each crypto in order to ensure that not only is the crypto Sharia compliant as a concept, but the underlying activities that back those cryptos are also Sharia compliant. So uh, if we look at the future of crypto, um, you know, you will have much more, uh, you know, central bank uh, digital currencies or what is called CBDCs coming out. And perhaps, you know, one of the most um, uh, striking benefits of crypto, um, you know, from an Islamic financial perspective uh, is perhaps, perhaps three important uh, elements. The first is in terms of potentially creating a gold-backed cryptocurrency or a gold-backed or silver-backed cryptocurrency that can be used by Muslim countries uh, like the OIC block of 52 Muslim states where they could trade among themselves um, and create a, a price stability, um, you know, within the system. If you look at the traditional uh, global economic system, uh, that fiat money has created more debt in the system. Uh, it has created a, a fake economy that is backed by debt and, and printing of money. And we look at things like quantitative easing, etc., where money is printed uh, without any value creation. So we need to come back to the original economic system where, um, you know, uh, the economy is backed by gold and silver. And perhaps one of the greatest, um, you know, uh, opportunities for the Muslim world is to regain its dominance uh, in the form of its resources by its economies being backed by a crypto that is backed by gold and silver. Because then we will regain our economic strength as Muslims and dominance, so that we can dominate again once in the field of, econo uh, of economics, trade, and commerce. And the Muslim world has, uh, has perhaps the greatest amount of resources in the form of oil, in the form of various resources that it can use to be backed by crypto uh, and, and regain its, its, its dominance again. Secondly, is that there is a huge opportunity for Islamic financial institutions to use smart contracts and blockchain in terms of in ensuring that we have a much more efficient economic system. And examples of this are 
that if there is, let's say, a Murabaha transaction or an Islamic trade finance transaction, that all of the different legs of that transaction are adequately performed uh, and conducted as per the correct sequence using the blockchain and, 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 and smart contracts. Uh, and lastly, I would say that from an Islamic financial perspective, we can use crypto and we can use token tokenization to eradicate poverty at a massive level. Uh, and what I mean by this is that there is huge cash economies in places like Africa, Asia, etc. If you look at Africa, it's 53% uh, Muslim, Muslim, uh, uh, Muslims in Africa. So the entire African population, 53% are Muslim. And there's a huge cash economy. And if we use crypto and tokenization and the blockchain, effectively, we're able to then eradicate poverty by linking uh, you know, opportunities, uh, you know, business opportunities, trading opportunities uh, to poorer people um, across Africa, Asia, et cetera, within Muslim countries, et cetera, that can trade with other parts of the world in an efficient, uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, I would now like to move over to the last two slides, which is uh, Islamic FinTech. Uh, so obviously Islamic FinTech uh, you know, links into the broader discussion on crypto and blockchain, et cetera. And as you can see, there are various subsets of Islamic FinTech. Uh, and perhaps there's a snapshot of Islamic FinTech uh, with the iPhone FinTech uh, landscape. Uh, and as you can see, there's a whole uh, host uh, of uh, Islamic fintech uh, platforms. And perhaps there is a huge opportunity to create what is called Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, trading exchanges to trade crypto, to, to trade Sharia, Sharia approved, uh, Sharia approved uh, cryptos. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to uh, terminate the first session of today's discussion around uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain by saying again that what we do today will determine the success of the Islamic finance industry in the future. The sustainability of this industry is our responsibility. Um, and lastly, I would like to mention that this topic and discussion of blockchain cryptocurrency um, is only meant to be uh, an initial discussion, but there is much more to dissect uh, and unpack uh, as we have. Uh, various other uh, webinars and, and sessions and delve deeper into the intricacies of cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to forward them to us at ceo at gifsrv.com um, or you can forward them to Taif Digital Institute of Islamic Finance, inshallah. And with that, uh, I would like to say uh, shukran jazilan. Uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Walaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for all of you joining once again. Inshallah, um, we'll be having further sessions with Sheikh and other uh, muftis, and we'll be sending you invitations on and off like this. Keep following Taif, keep following Sheikh. Inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.